The key to understanding vertebral artery ischemia is in understanding the anatomy and physiology of the system and the pathologies that affect it. This is no different from any other subject that we study, nor of any other system that we treat. Two arterial systems vascularize the brain, brainstem, and to a large part the, brain, the spinal cord. The internal carotid and the vertebra basilar. The former system comprises the anterior system and supplies the forebrain for the most part, while the latter supplies the hindbrain, cerebellum, and spinal cord. Both arteries average about 4 mm, with the carotid being a little larger. The circle of Willis is where the two systems link up, and this complex allows blood to be shunted back and forth as required. The slide on the left is a diagram showing an idealized version of the systems. That on the right is from a dissection. Note the common variant where one artery is larger than the other. The vertebral artery is described in four parts. The osteal or V1, which is its most distal part. The transverse or V2, where it runs up the neck in the transverse tunnel. The suboccipital part, V3, running between C2 and the atlas, and finally the intracranial portion, V4, from the foramen magnum to where it forms the basilar at the lower border of the pons. The osteal portion, or V1, has a lot of slack in it as it must be able to accommodate large ranges of neck movement. It usually comes off the subclavian as the first branch and runs up in front of C7 to enter the transverse foramen of C6 where it becomes V2. There are no branches from this portion. V2, or the transverse, transverse portion, runs up the transverse tunnel from C6, 90% or more of the time, to the transverse foramen of C2, where it becomes V3. It takes up between 8 to 85% of the space in the transverse tunnel, which averages 6 mm in diameter. The transverse tunnel is formed by the transverse foramen anteriorly, by the longus colli, posteriorly by the zygopophyseal joints and their capsules, laterally by the scalenes, and medially by the vertebral body and the uncovertebral joint. It is also ensheathed in periosteum to protect and stiffen it. Branches from this portion are the radicular arteries which participate in the vascularization of the spinal cord. V3, the suboccipital portion, begins at the transverse process of C2 and ends at the frame of magnum. The artery takes about three right angle turns in its passage, passing beyond the arch of atlas in a groove in which it is held in place by a restraining ligament. This seems to be the area where most injuries occur. Branches are the osseomuscular branch which supplies the atlas and axis vertebra and the posterior suboccipital muscles. The intracranial portion, or V4, runs up the front of the medulla and joins with its opposite number at the lower border of the pons to form the basilar artery. The anterior spinal, or sulcal artery, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or pica, are its branches. The basilar artery forms a union from the union of both vertebrals and runs midline along the pons and terminates by bifurcating as a posterior cerebellar cerebral arteries. Its branches are the pontine, labyrinthine, or internal acoustic, anterior inferior cerebellar, acre, and the superior cerebellar arteries. The circle of Willis is the junction of the vertebral basilar and carotid systems. The posterior cerebral artery gives off the posterior communicating artery, which joins with the middle cerebral artery. This gives off the anterior cerebral, and the two are joined by the anterior communicating artery, forming a complete circle around the base of the brain. Blood is shunted back and forth, depending on the brain's requirements. Diagrams give the illusion that the entire system is vertical, with the vertebrobasilar system laying inferiorly and the carotid system superiorly. But of course that is not true, as the angiogram shows. The vertebral arteries do run vertically, but the circle is horizontal. This diagram shows all the parts of the vertebra basilar system in context to the spine. Note the different names for the parts of the system in this diagram. The spinal cord is supplied by the anterior and posterior spinal arteries and local radicular arteries. In the neck, these radicular arteries come off the vertebral, run through the vertebral foramen, and the spinal nerve then split to run with each nerve root until they reach the cord, where they anastomose with the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. The anterior spinal artery arises from each V4 just as they form and runs down the anterior median fissure, or sulcus, of the spinal cord. The origin of the posterior spinal arteries is highly variable, but often comes from its picker, and each artery, or sometimes pair of arteries, run down the medial side of the posterior root, or medial and lateral if paired.
This and the following page are summaries of which branches come from where and what they vascularize. There are no branches from V1 and only the radicular from V2. The number of radicular arteries is variable, but rarely is there one for each segment. Typically, the C5 and C3 segments receive branches. The radicular artery supplies the spinal nerve and nerve roots and their dura, the spinal meninges and the spinal cord, together with the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. V3 gives off osteomuscular branches that supply the axis and atlas vertebra and the posterior suboccipital muscles. Intracranially, V4 supplies the medulla, cerebellum and the spinal cord via the pica and anterior and posterior spinal arteries. The basilla directly supplies the cerebellum, pons and midbrain via the pontine, acre and superior cerebellar arteries and the eighth nerve and labyrinth by the labyrinthine artery. The posterior cerebral artery bifurcates as the cortical and thalamic arteries, the former splits again into the calcerine and temporal arteries, and the latter supplies the thalamus. The calcerine artery supplies the optical or calcerine radiation and the visual cortex, while the temporal supplies Wernicke's area. Anomalies are the rule with the vertebra basilar system, for example, only about 40% of the population have roughly equal sized arteries. The majority have one dominant and one minor artery. We can consider anomalies to the specific region in which they occur or those that occur throughout or at any point in the system. V1 in anomalies include the artery arising from the aorta, from the common carotid, or from the underside of the subclavian. Probably none of these anomalies will be too much affected by anything we do and are of more concern to the surgeon. The starting point of V2 is very consistent, being above 90% into C6, but it can be much higher or rarely lower. The commonest other entry point is C5 and less commonly higher. The higher the entry point, the more susceptible the artery is to muscular fibrous compression and torque forces. So this is another reason to avoid large rotational displacements of the neck during manual treatments. The proatlanteal artery is a major problem for surgeons, pro probably less of a problem for us. But again, the increased torque forces produced by the artery being further from the axis of rotation would lead to a natural tendency to avoid rotation and manipulation. Ossification of the restraining ligament or ponticulation bridging also appears to produce stenosis, and this is known to exist, should produce caution in the therapist when it comes to manipulating this patient. The atriotic artery is probably the most significant region-specific anomaly from our perspective. This is where the vertebral artery on one side does not inject into the basilar artery but terminates as a picker. It means that if the good side is damaged, there is no backup from the atriotic side beyond the picker. Systemic anomalies affect either the entire system or can affect any part of it. By the way, the photograph is of a huge basilar aneurysm. As previously stated, only about 40% of the population have equal sized arteries. In most, one artery, usually the right, is smaller than the other. The large artery is called the dominant and the small artery, the minor. If the minor artery is one millimeter or less in diameter, it does not significantly contribute to the vascular supply and is termed hypoblastic. And if the good artery is damaged, there is no backup from it. Unilateral absence of the artery effectively has the same effect as hypoplasticity. In some cases, both vertebral arteries can be absent, but the segmental fetal arteries persist so blood flow is maintained. Fibromuscular dysplasia, FMD, is a congenital weakness of the arterial wall giving rise to what are essentially a series of aneurysms with alternating areas of strong and weak walls. In the slide, there are estimated to be 16 areas of weakness. The initial weakness of an aneurysm is often congenital, but the ballooning out of the vessel usually requires a trigger such as hypertension. Initial effects depend on the size and locations, with small aneurysms being unnoticed, but if it ruptures then the closed space of the cranium can fill with blood with lethal effect. If the aneurysm becomes large enough, then pressure syndromes follow. This slide depicts two top of the basilar aneurysms. 